Movies and shows often inaccurately portray engineers. They tend to exaggerate and oversimplify our abilities. This is what I mean. I thought you said you were done making weapons. It is. This is a flight stabilizer. It's completely harmless. I didn't expect that. As much as I wish engineers were like Tony Stark, who can single-handedly design, build, and test entire machines in a blink of an eye, the reality is we work and collaborate with hundreds, if not thousands of people to bring a product from an idea to mass production, which may take a year or even a decade. So I decided to make a video to clear up some common misconceptions and share what I do day to day as a mechanical engineer. Just like humans, products have their own life cycles and go through four key stages, introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. The job of a mechanical engineer is to design, build, analyze, test, and optimize the hardware components, sub-assemblies, and assemblies that make up a functional product. We are responsible for a product throughout the entire development stage of the product lifecycle. In the development stage, we closely follow the product development process, which is used to take a product from initial concept to store shelves. This process can vary slightly from company to company, but in general, it consists of six key steps. Conceptual design, prototype design, detailed design, validation, optimization, and production. It's very important for mechanical engineers to be familiar with this process, so I'll explain the work I do and the people I work with in each of these six steps. The first step consists of deciding on a product concept that has the greatest potential for success and that customers will love. As engineers, we don't have to worry about this problem as much, and it's primarily marketing's job to define the product vision, feasibility of the product, and pricing. Product managers will tell us how many colors will be offered, the overall product dimensions, and what type of features the phone must offer, such as dynamic island, and how many lenses the camera has to have. They'll also tell us that it must be splash, dust, and water resistant. To start out, industrial or product designers will create a digital surface model that details what the product will look and feel like based on the requirements provided by marketing. They will then send us this digital surface model as a step file so that we can import it into our computer-aided design or CAD software such as Inventor, SolidWorks, Creo, NX, or Katia. This way we know precisely how much space we have to work with and how big or small to make internal components. Next is the second step, prototype design. Here we will work with other mechanical engineers in the same team, as well as electrical, manufacturing, optical, and software engineers create a proof of concept that demonstrates the product's basic features and feasibility. In this stage, we'll use CAD software, say SOLIDWORKS, to create high-level preliminary 3D models of each component and corresponding 2D technical drawings so that each part can be made later on. However, keep in mind that the manufacturing processes used to make the parts of the proof of concept will ultimately differ from the processes used to make the parts of the final product. For example, let's say we are designing a phone. We would use 3D printing to create multiple iterations of the phone's chassis for the proof of concept, and in the next stage, we would refine the part design so that it can be mass produced using CNC machining or casting in a cost-effective and efficient way. We will also begin to gather initial information from electrical and optical engineers to see how big the printed circuit boards, sensors, battery, camera lenses, and wiring need to be, and how everything will fit together, be mounted, and sealed. Obviously, the design will constantly evolve and change as we move through the product development process and all aspects of the design is fine-tuned. For example, in the final product, the internal electrical components will be secured via mounting features such as screw bosses using a combination of screws and special adhesive, but for the proof of concept, these mounting features would not be included and double-sided tape will be used instead. Many features and components like buttons and sides 
switches will be replaced by dummy components in the proof of concept. In this stage, we will also begin selecting materials for each component based on functional and technical specifications of the product. For example, if the phone's chassis needs to be corrosion resistant, dissipate heat quickly, lightweight, impact resistant, weldable, and easily machinable, then we will need to use a systematic method to choose the optimal material, such as an Ashby chart. Moving on to the third step, we have detailed design. This is a very critical step where we design and incorporate all of the mechanical features of the actual product into the 3D CAD model for each component and subassembly. You need to ask questions like, can this undercut be produced? If yes, will it drive up part cost? Can these parts be assembled and disassembled easily? Should I use snap features or screws to mount this part? Does this part require a loose or tight tolerance? Do these two parts require a clearance, transition, or interference fit? Once the design is pretty much nailed down, we create and release the production drawings, which look like this. These drawings show different views of the component and call out critical dimensions, tolerances, and specify information about the component's material, surface finish, and revision number. We then send these drawings to different suppliers who give us valuable manufacturing feedback, as well as a quote, which details the total cost needed to make, assemble, and ship these parts. We will also create a bill of materials or BOM, which is just a list containing all of the parts, sub-assemblies, their part numbers, and quantities of each needed to make the final product. We will also work with quality and manufacturing engineers to create the quality, test, and manufacturing plans, explaining how the quality of the product will be controlled, how the product will be tested, and what processes, equipment, and how much labor will be required to assemble the final product. In this stage, electrical and optical engineers also need to provide us with the finalized printed circuit board layouts and optical designs containing important information such as sensor location so that we can begin to finalize the CAD model and perform a tolerance stack up analysis to make sure that everything fits together and that there are no interference issues. The entire engineering team will have several technical design reviews to identify weaknesses in the design, potential failures that might occur, such as battery leakage, and the effects of these failures before the product is actually manufactured, assembled, and sold. A common approach used in industry for identifying failures, causes, and effects is failure modes and effects analysis, or FMEA, which most schools don't teach. Finally, the last thing we do is source parts to build 20 to 50 units using the intended materials and manufacturing processes for engineering design validation testing or EVT to ensure all functional product requirements are met. If say a design flaw is discovered during testing, we will go back to the drawing board, improve the design by adding structural ribs, and then run a finite element analysis study to validate the performance of the design change. We then move into the validation stage. This stage focuses on testing the shit out of the product. Typically, we send 50 to 200 units for rigorous regulatory testing, such as burning, drop testing, ingress protection testing, environmental testing, and extensive battery testing. Take an iPhone 14 for instance. Apple advertises that it has an IP68 rating under IEC standard 60529, which just means that this phone is water resistant up to a depth of six meters for 30 minutes. In order to receive this rating, Apple probably had a certified test lab perform the ingress protection test. For smaller companies, you might also be responsible for designing fixtures used to test the product or fixtures and jigs used to hold components in place during assembly of the final product. Larger companies like Apple will partner with contract manufacturers like Foxconn who does everything for them. After putting the product through so much testing, we move into the optimization or refinement stage. In this stage, it's very likely you'll find some weak points in the product, whether it's design, quality, or manufacturing related. This is the last opportunity for you to figure things out and get things right before the product is mass produced and sold. We'll also work with manufacturers to ensure that manufacturing processes such as tooling are fine tuned, quality assurance and control procedures are finalized so that high quality parts are coming off the line and any outstanding issues like packaging is addressed. 
The design becomes frozen at this stage, which simply means that any subsequent engineering change that needs to be made will require us to first complete an engineering change notice or ECN, whose purpose is to document the design change and the reason for the change. So for example, if I were to leave the company and two years later, a new engineer was working on the same product, he or she could see all the design changes that were made and when exactly they were made. Finally, the last stage is production. And at this point, mechanical engineers are usually completely hands off. Some minor issues that require your support might come up from time to time, but it's very likely you'll already be assigned to a new project by your engineering manager. All of the things I mentioned so far are engineering related, but keep in mind that almost every engineering job will come with a lot of non-technical and administrative duties, which I like to call busy work. If I had to break down the time I spend doing all of the different types of work as a mechanical engineer, I'd say 40% of my time is spent in meetings, which includes design reviews, one-on-one -on -one meetings, department meetings, and meetings with suppliers. 40% is spent designing, analyzing, or testing products. Finally, the remaining 20% is spent talking to people, replying to emails, writing reports, ordering parts or raw materials, and completing engineering change notices. Obviously, every mechanical engineering role will be slightly different because mechanical engineering itself is a very broad discipline. If your job is product design oriented, it's very likely the work will be very similar to mine. And if it's process design oriented, you'll more likely work on designing and optimizing the manufacturing processes used to create products. Anyway, that's it for today, guys. As always, thank you so much for watching. And if you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.